Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome. So glad you're here. Welcome to New Hope, and uh, welcome to all of you who are watching online. We're so glad you're with us. All of you here in the room, hey, do me a favor. Make sure everybody feels welcome. Turn to two or three people. Tell them, hey, glad you're here. Glad you're here. You guys online, glad you're here. Let us know you're glad to be here. Put in the comments or something. All right, well, we are in uh, session four of this series we're doing called The Book, and we're talking about this book called The Bible, and uh, th- really just kind of looking at what is it really, and what is it about, and how do we understand it. Uh, we did a message the first week called What is the Bible? Uh, the second week was Is the Bible Reliable? I really encourage you guys, that Is the Bible Reliable one, if you missed that, I encourage you to go back and watch that, listen to it, maybe share it with other people. It's one of those that will kind of raise your faith level, or if you're struggling with faith or not sure about faith, it will help you understand uh, why this book is actually super powerful. And and then last week, Jake did a great job talking about doubt and dealing with doubt and all that kind of thing. So today, uh, we're going to do a message called, Is the Bible All or Nothing? But before we get into that, let me just say, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons, or the primary reason, the purpose of the Bible that we've been covering in this whole series, the purpose of the Bible is to reveal Jesus. That's really the purpose of Scripture, start to finish. The Old Testament is the story leading up to Jesus. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the stories about Jesus. And the rest of the New Testament is how do you actually live for Jesus. And as Jesus gets revealed to us because he is God in the flesh and we're not God, our own brokenness starts to get revealed. We start to go, whoa, I'm not quite where I need to be. There's some changes I need to make in my life. And then the Bible invites us into something so much better. And that, that biblical language for that so much better is things like new life and transformation and salvation and the kingdom of God and eternal life and those kind of things. So, so it's a beautiful uh, process that God takes us through as he begins to reveal Jesus to us through his word. In short, because some of you, you know, you know, honestly, some of you, if you're really honest, growing up, or maybe even as an adult, the Bible was used against you as a weapon. It's kind of weaponized against you, and, and so you were, you know, you just were taught things that made you feel like you could never be right with God, you could never measure up, you could never be loved fully by God. And I just want to say I'm so sorry that happened to you, but also I'm hopeful that in this series you find some healing for your heart in that. And you realize that, uh, in short, what what I'm saying in all this is that the Bible is intended to be helpful, not hurtful. That is really the intention of God's Word, is to be helpful, not hurtful. And Jesus actually talked about this in Matthew chapter 7, at the end of his his longest sermon recorded, called the Sermon on the Mount. At the end of it, in Matthew chapter 7, he makes some really uh, bold statements about this. In fact, let's go ahead and put it on the screen. This is Jesus speaking. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. In other words, everyone who listens to the word of God and actually does something with it, applies it to their lives, is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So so what is Jesus saying? He's saying, look, if you actually take my word, engage my word, and actually apply it to your life, you're still going to have trouble. I mean, we all know that, right? Can I get an amen on life is tough? Is that, that's right, right? We all know there's going to be trouble. Jesus said, you know, either way, whether you apply my word or not, the rain's going to come, the streams are going to rise, and and there's going to be wind, and all these trouble in life. But at the end of the day, if you apply my word to your life, your house will still be standing even in the midst of the storms. And that's really good news, guys. That's really good news. But that only comes as we actually apply the Word of God to our lives. We put it into practice. It kind of reminds me of uh, last year, I had some buddies over at my house, and uh, we were hanging out on the back patio, 
and uh, we were just doing what guys do. You know, we had a game on the TV screen, sound was off so we could still talk, and we had some food and some drinks, and we had a, it was a great time, you know, and, and one of the things when you're guys and you get together that you have is you, you put a frozen pizza in the oven, you know, and you pull it out when it's done, and, and so I pulled out this frozen pizza, and I, and I got out my handy-dandy pizza cutter, and it's a re- it was a really great pizza cutter. I mean, it was like an industrial-grade pizza cutter from Snap-on, not Walmart. I mean, it's a serious one. You know what I mean? And so I start cutting my pizza. And usually when I would cut pizza with this thing, man, it was, you know, like that. And uh, this time, it wouldn't cut. I mean, it was just like, and, and what do we do as guys when our tools don't work properly? We, we usually cuss, and then we, <laughs> and then, and then we apply more pressure, right? That's, that's what we do. We apply more pressure. Arr! So I applied more pressure to my industrial-grade pizza cutter, and it literally broke in my hand. And I'm like, dang, this pizza is tough. So I take it out to the guys, and I'm like, guys, this pizza is so tough, you're not going to want it. I couldn't even cut through it hardly. But if you want some, have it. And so we're guys, so we all took a piece. And, uh, and we bit into it, and it was like, uh, we tried to bite into it. Uh, and it just, some of you ladies are ahead of me. You know what I did. Um, so so we, we couldn't bite through it. And one of the guys stops, and he looks at it, and he goes, dude, you left the cardboard on. <laughs> and all I get... All I could think of, so, so that, that pizza cutter, by the way, was from my friend John Crow. So during worship, John was in first service, so during worship, he brought me a new snap-on pizza cutter. So this is the real deal, guys. Don't try to cut cardboard with it. But all I could think of afterwards was, what if I'd read the instructions? What if I'd actually looked at the instructions on the box that would have told me to take the cardboard off before I cooked the pizza? And, and I know that's a really silly illustration, but I think it's kind of, kind of picturesque for us of our lives about the Word of God. What if we actually read it and engaged it and applied it to our lives as opposed to just trying to live on our own? Because most of us, if we're really honest, we just pretty much kind of power through life. We just power through life on our own or whatever we think is the right thing to do or whatever some of the things our parents told us to do, and it sort of works until it doesn't. And Jesus is saying to us, hey, hey guys, would you actually apply my word to your life? You're still going to have trouble. The winds are going to blow. The rain's going to come, but your house will be standing at the end of the day if you stay true to my word. Let's pray, and we'll talk about it. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for calling us to yourself. Thank you for the word of God, that when we apply it to our lives, not just when we observe it, not just when we even believe it, but when we actually apply it to our lives, it brings transformation to us and to others. And so, God, would you help us today to fully embrace everything that you have for us in the strong, life-changing name of Jesus. Amen. So back to our question. (laughs) Is the Bible all or nothing? In other words, uh, can I struggle with this part and still believe this part, or believe this part and struggle with this part, or or can I can I see the Word of God as, uh, as, as God's Word, but I'm not sure about certain parts, and I'm trying to understand certain parts. And, and Jake did a really good job last week talking about, yeah, we actually do have some doubts. There's a process. We're in a process along the way with God's Word of trying to understand what He's saying to us. And, and there's parts of it we don't understand at times. There's parts of it we wrestle with. But see, so, so the answer to the question Is the Bible all or nothing? Some of you are going to hate this answer, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. Is the Bible all or nothing? The answer is yes and no. Yes and no. The no part is there's a a wrestle, there's a journey, there's a process for us, and there's parts of it that we don't understand. There's parts that we're like, oh man, God, I don't get this part yet. And the yet is really important. Just because we don't get it now doesn't mean we're not going to get it tomorrow. Just because we don't understand it today doesn't mean he's not going to give us revelation to what it means in the future. But he wants to show us himself over time as a journey, as a relationship. But sometimes people, 
get so concerned about this that they begin to put things on us and say, well, if you don't believe it the way I believe it or see it the way I see it, then you don't really love God. And I think that's problematic. There are red lines in scripture. There are things, and we're going to look at the main one in a few minutes. There are things that are just uncompromising. They are what they are. But there's a lot of it that we are on a journey and trying to discover and trying to figure out. It's okay to be on a journey. It's okay to be trying to figure it out. In fact, it's a good thing. Jesus said, seek and you will find. Keep on seeking. Keep on asking. Keep on searching. The key is not to give up. And, but so often people want to put God in, a, in their box, you know? It's like the lady who told me one time, you know, if you don't believe in a literal six-day, 24-hour-a-day creation, then you don't believe in the Bible. Ah. And I did say to her, uh, first I said, well, you know, God says a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, so I'm not sure exactly what that means. But the other thing I said to her is, I, I believe the Bible, I just don't believe you. And she left our church for some reason. Anyway, um, <laughs> but sometimes people will put stuff on you that God is not necessarily putting on you. And it's easy to get caught up in that and think that that's what God is saying somehow. Can I just be really honest with you guys? Can we be honest today? Everybody okay with honesty? There are some things in God's word, especially in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, that I'm not sure what's metaphorical and what's literal. I'm not sure. And some people will say they're really sure when they're really not. Like in the 80s, I was alive back then. In the 80s, there was a book written. It sold over 300,000 copies. It was a book written. It was about Jesus, the 88 reasons Jesus is coming back in 1988. And then 1988 came and went, and Jesus hadn't come back. So he wrote a second book. <laughs> I missed it, or something like that. He did write a second book, but it didn't sell very many copies. Anyway, but sometimes we, we do that, right? We, we put those things on people, or we put those things on ourselves that God is not necessarily putting on us. You know, if someone tells you they understand every single thing about Revelation, they know what every single thing is, what's metaphorical and what's literal and what's not, they're either lying to you or they're doing meth. I don't know which one, but... but it's, it's not totally clear. There is a mystery to God. Here's what I know from the book of Revelation. You know what I know? Jesus is coming back and it's going to be awesome. That's what I know for sure. That's what I know for sure. But there's other parts of it I'm not quite sure about. And it's okay. And I believe God to be faithful to show us things over time. The one constant, the red line in Scripture, however is Jesus. That's, that's non-compromisable, if you will. Jesus is the red line of Scripture. The whole story is about Jesus. It's designed to point us to Jesus, and he is the ultimate end to the story. Jesus is God with skin on. He is God in the flesh. He came to earth. God came to earth as this man, Jesus, to bring new life to us, to show us how to live, to show us the way to live. He is the way, the truth, and the life. In fact, John uh, 14, in John 14, Jesus made this crystal clear. I mean, he just, he just left no question about it. He was talking to some of his disciples, and his disciples had some questions, just like we have questions. It's, it's okay to have questions, but Jesus answers these questions with absolute clarity. Look at what he, he says. This is Thomas asking for, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way. I am the way and the truth and the life. And then he adds this next sentence to be really crystal clear. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And for first century Jews, who Jesus, Jesus was a first century Jew, and he was speaking to first century Jews, the term the Father referred to God. 
He's saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. And, and, then, uh, and then Philip, one of his other disciples, has a follow-up question. <laughs> have you ever been frustrated as a leader with your people because they have questions? I'm just saying. It's like Jesus is like, okay, guys, are you ever going to get this? Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And he's got to be thinking, what, did you hear what I just said? But he's, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, and look at this last line, just to clear it up 100% completely, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is God come to earth. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and then Peter quotes, he says this later in, in Acts chapter four, he says salvation, he's speaking about Jesus, he says salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Our belief about Jesus is what unifies us as his followers and is inviolable. You see, guys, the Bible the Bible is not God. I, I know some of you are like, well, duh, but, but sometimes we kind of get confused. The Bible is not God. It is a tool, or some of you might prefer the word revelation. It is a tool that leads us to Jesus who is God. That is the Bible. It is God's revelation to us to reveal to us who Jesus is because Jesus is God in the flesh. And and the reason I'm I'm, I'm, I'm so uh, spending time on this, staying here, is because if that is true, if Jesus is who he says he is, then Jesus deserves a response from us. In fact, I would say it this way, Jesus requires a response from us. We don't like things like require, do we? We don't like that. He demands a response from us. We have to decide as human beings, okay, Jesus, this is who you say you are, and I as a human, as a person, have to decide, what will I do with that? Will I Will I agree with that and then surrender my life to Jesus or will I disagree with that and go a different direction? There's really not an in-between space here. Jesus didn't leave any room for in-between on this issue. We can have doubts about a lot of stuff. We can have questions. We can have concerns. We can be in process. But at some point, we have to decide what we're going to do with Jesus. And it's not enough to just say, well, I think he's a good guy. He didn't leave room for that. He's either God or he's not. So we have to decide, what am I going to do with Jesus? Am I, is Jesus the leader of my life? Am I going to reorient my life around this Jesus? Am I go, if he is who he says he is, how is my life different because of who he says he is? Because if Jesus is God, then I've got to consider how I am living and what I am doing with my life, and is he going to be my God or is someone else or something else going to be my God? You see, we can can say that we believe all the right stuff and and it means very little, honestly. James, in James chapter two, said it it this way. Look look at what James said. James said, "You, you say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. In other words, you believe all the right stuff Good for you. (laughs) So snarky, isn't it? Such a snarky response. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? In other words, can't you see that if if you say you're a follower of Jesus, if you have aligned your life with Jesus, that your life needs to be realigning and be reoriented to the ways of Jesus. So what does that even mean? What does that look like? What does it look like to genuinely follow Jesus? Because, uh, you know, we can just theorize about that, and we can say, oh, well, just in general, you should follow Jesus. That's a good idea. <laughs> so every week we talk about some kind of application, but, but I want to really differentiate between what the world invites us into and what Jesus is inviting us into. 
And so I'm going to compare those two from the book of Matthew. We could make a much longer list, but from the book of Matthew, because we've been going through the book of Matthew as a church family. And so I'm just going to, from the book of Matthew, compare to the world's invitation to Jesus' invitation. And, uh, and, if, if, and I'm going to put this on the screen. You can take a picture of it if you want to and help you remember it or whatever. But I, it's, we're going to walk through this, okay? So let, let's put it on the screen here. The world's invitation as opposed to Jesus' invitation. The first invitation from the world is to compare, compare, compare. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> that is the world's way, right? Compare everything. And social media just drives this even more. Compare, compare, compare. Compare your house, compare your car, compare your looks, compare your, your clothes, compare your kids. If you got kids, compare your kid. compare your uh, sorry, marriage, compare, compare your bank account, compare your followers, compare everything in your life all the time in your life, and it leads to either being really, really prideful or really, really shamed. That's what that leads to. Jesus' invitation, on the other hand, is to identity in him. Why, why does that matter up against comparison? Well, think about it. He invites us to identify ourselves as sons and daughters of the living God. See, when you give your life to Christ, you are adopted into God's family. In other words, you are at that moment, you become a son or a daughter of the king. You become a prince or a princess in the kingdom of God. Think about princes and princesses. They don't care about what anybody else is doing. <laughs> they got it going on. They're at the top. They got everything they need. They, they are cared for and loved by the, the king or the queen or whoever it is. They have got it going on. And guys, when we give our lives to Christ, he says, you are now my son. You're now my daughter. You're a prince or a princess in my kingdom. You don't got to compare yourself with anybody because ain't nobody got nothing on you. That's an amazing thing when we begin to have that kind of identity in our lives. Look, look at the next one. The world invites us to choose sides. Always choose sides. You're either this or you're that. You're right or you're wrong. You're Republican or you're Democrat or you're this. Ah, you got to choose sides all the time. Choose sides. I mean, gosh, the, the news media makes us want to choose sides on every time we watch anything. But look at Jesus' invitation to be peacemakers. For peacemakers will see the kingdom of God. You know what peacemakers do? They bring sides together. That's what peacemakers do. Peacemakers are bridges. You know the thing about bridges? It, bridges, to be a bridge, you have to be comfortable with footings on both sides of the divide. Peacemakers, bridge builders don't divide. They bring the sides together. Can you imagine for a moment if Washington, D.C. was filled with peacemakers instead of politicians, how different our country would feel and how it would be? Wouldn't that be amazing? That is what Jesus calls us into, not to pick sides, but to bring sides together. Look at the next one. The world's invitation is to hold a grudge. Hold a grudge. Be angry. Don't let them off the hook. You know, you hurt me, I hurt you. Cut me, I cut you. Hold a grudge. Jesus' invitation is to forgive freely, radically, ridiculously. Jesus told Peter, he said, you know, Peter, Peter, don't forgive once or twice or three times. Forgive 70 times seven times. The number seven in scripture is the number for infinity or completion. Jesus is literally saying, Peter, and to all of us, forgive 70 times infinity times. In other words, never stop forgiving. Always forgive. Always forgive. No matter what, you've got to choose forgiveness. It will change the world, and it will change you from the inside out if you choose forgiveness over hatred and holding grudges. Look, look at the next one. The world in, invites us to freedom without limits. Freedom without limits. Do whatever you want. Say whatever you want. Be whatever you want. Don't let anybody tell you what to do. Don't have any boundaries. You just do your thing. Have sex with whoever you want, whenever you want, however you want. Do it, do it, go whatever. Do it. Just no limits. No limits whatsoever. Do your thing. That is the world's invitation. Here's the problem with freedom with no limits. Is freedom with no limits leads to selfishness. And selfishness leads to loneliness. The more self-focused I am, the more lonely I become. Jesus' invitation, on the other hand, is not to freedom without limits, but to pursue purity in our lives, purity in our hearts first. 
security in our hearts. God, I want to be right before you. God, whatever you say, I agree with. I'm going your way. I'm going to choose your way, Jesus. I want my heart to be pure before you. I want to treat others the way you want me to treat them. I want to follow you with all of my heart. I want to live by your ethics, by your sexual ethic of of sex being for a man and a woman in a loving, committed relationship. I want to follow you in the purity of my heart and the purity of my actions and everything that I'm doing. I want my life to align with you and what you want. That is Jesus' invitation to us, and we get to say yes or no to it along the way. Again, look at the next one, the world's invitation. Love those who love me and hate those who hate me. Jesus' invitation, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Wow, would that change the world or what? World's invitation, dispose of inconveniences. Whatever or whoever inconveniences me, get them out of the way. Jesus' invitation is to value every person on the planet, no matter who they are, no matter what their background is, no matter what color of their skin is, no matter what their language is, no matter what country they're from. Value every child in the mother's womb and every child at the border. It's not one or the other. It's not choose size. We value all those children because they're all, they all represent God because they are made in the image of God. World's invitation is to worry, worry, worry. Can I get an amen on that one? (laughs) Worry about everything. Worry about everything. In fact, if you don't worry, that means you don't care. Jesus' invitation is put God first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek God first and worry less. Worry less. Let go of worry. Because I'm a good father, just like we sang about today. He's a good father, and he really does have good things in mind for us. Yes, you will go through some hard times. Yes, you will face some difficulties. But at the end of the day, if you, if you stand on the rock, your house will be standing at the end of the day. This is Jesus' invitation to us, guys. And every one of us as human beings have to decide what we're going to do with Jesus. And and are we going to align ourselves with this Jesus that many of us say that we follow? So how do you actually do that? Like how how do you actually begin the process of realigning yourself with the ways of Jesus. And so I want to share, and pretty much, again, every week we talk about aligning ourselves with Jesus, but I want to give you a really uh, simple, simple tool that God has used in my life for the last couple of years, and it's so simple that when I say it, you're going to think I'm stupid, all right? You're going to be like, that's dumb. That'll never work. But I just, I want to challenge you to try it because this, what I'm about to share with you has been so life-changing for me over the last couple of years. Uh, I just have to share it with you, and I think it will make a huge difference in your life if you actually try it or try a version of it. And it is simply this. Over the last two years, um, every night... Before I go to bed, I go out on my back patio, or if it's too cold, I stand at my back window. <laughs> Every night before I go to bed, I, stand, I go to my back patio, and again, it's so simple, and I pray the Lord's Prayer. Every night. And guys, it's been surprisingly transformational in my life. It's a simple prayer. Jesus gave it to us in Matthew chapter 6. This is how he told us to pray. It's a template for prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. You see the realignment in that? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts or our trespasses as we also have forgiven our trespassers and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So, to finish this talk today, what I'd like to do is I'm going to pray this prayer uh, with us, all of you online, all of you here in the room. I'm just going to pray this prayer with us, and, and, I, and I'm not asking you to say it out loud with me because I'm going to freestyle a little bit here like I do uh, at night when I'm praying this prayer. But I hope that you can agree with this prayer. That's what I'd like you to do. Just agree in your heart with this prayer as much as you can. 
And, uh, and I just encourage you, um, man, we're going to start praying. And if you want to, for prayer, if you want to stand or you want to sit or you want to kneel or you want to close your eyes or open your eyes, or you want to open your hand as, as a way of opening your heart, uh, a lot of us like to do that here. Um, just whatever you need to do, get in a posture of prayer. And even if you're not a follower of Jesus, I just encourage you to just open yourself up to this prayer. Just open yourself up to this prayer. Just, just, yeah, just let it kind of roll over you, if nothing else. And what we're going to do by praying this prayer is we're going to be intentionally aligning ourselves and reorienting ourselves with the will and the ways of Jesus. So here's the prayer. Our Father in heaven. Father, thank you so much that it's we, it's our, it's we, it's not me. Thank you that we're not alone, God. Our Father in heaven. Thank you that you're a good Father like we sing about this morning. Hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Mighty is your name all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present is your name, God. You are beautiful, faithful, incomparable, unfathomable. That is your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, God. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Not my will, God. Not my kingdom, but your kingdom. Your will be done, God. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in our families, God. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in our marriages. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in our children and our grandchildren and to a thousand generations after us. May your kingdom come and your will be done in our church, God. God, may every time, every time we come together, may we look like you, feel like you, represent you. your kingdom come. Your will be done in our city, God. In Wiley, Texas. In our county, Collin County, God. May your kingdom come and your will be done in Dallas, Fort Worth. May your kingdom come and your will be done in our state, in this country. In Washington, D.C., God, may your kingdom come and your will be done in this world of yours. And Father, would you give us today our daily bread? Would you give us everything we need to do everything you've called us to do and to be everything you've called us to be? God, would you be our provision relationally? Would you be our provision emotionally? Would you be our provision mentally? Would you be our provision financially, God? And as you bless us, as you pour out your blessings in our lives, God, would you make us a, a generous people? Would you make us a giving people? God, help us to give to your church. Help us to give to your kingdom. Help us to give to those in need. Help us to give, God, like you've given to us. Father, would you forgive us our trespasses, for they are many. God, we've all made mistakes in our lives. We've all hurt people. Sometimes, many times, people we didn't mean to, and sometimes people we did. And 
God, we need your forgiveness. God, would you forgive us where we've been manipulative or controlling? God, where we've been passive? God, where we've gone our own way rather than going your way, would you forgive us? Our trespasses. As you forgive us, as we forgive those who trespass against us, God, would you help us to forgive other people the way you've forgiven us? And lead us not into temptation. Oh God, it's everywhere. Temptation is all around us. Would you lead us not into temptation, but would you deliver us from evil? God, deliver us from evil. Deliver us from selfishness and envy and jealousy, unforgiveness and bitterness. God, deliver us from greed. God, deliver us from selfishness. God, would you deliver us as North Americans from pride and arrogance? thinking we're better than other people around the world? God, would you deliver the Ukrainians? God, deliver the Ukrainians from the oppression and evil of war and violence. God, would you deliver the people of Russia and China from the oppression of dictatorship? God, would you deliver the African countries from the evil of corruption? God, would you deliver the Asian countries from the evil of lawlessness? God, would you deliver us from evil? And may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth, in and through our lives as it is in heaven. And we ask it all in the mighty, life-changing, powerful, all-consuming name of Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Thanks for joining us online today. If you have youth between 6th grade and 12th grade, we meet on Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 8.15. Also, if you would like to partner with us financially, you can click on the giving tab on our New Hope website. Thanks, and have a great rest of the week.